great. Thank All you, Julie. Right. There we go, Wendy. All right. Well, guys, well, today's session, we thank you for joining us, um, Health Benefits of the Mediterranean Diet. Also wanted to highlight, we have a few other webinars going on this month. This Thursday, Maintaining Your Auto, which these are the financial uh, webinars. And then on March 30th, there's one on traditional versus Roth IRAs. And in April, we'll have one on, an update on the 2015 Dietary Guidelines. So who are we? We are the University of Florida IFAS Extension, which is a federal, state, and county partnership. And what we do is we connect, we educate um, our communities with some research-based information and resources that address youth, family, community, as well as agricultural needs. And right now we're in all 67 counties that are in Florida, and most of those counties do have a family and consumer sciences agent present. So here's your webinar team for today. Um, on the far left you see Dr. Wendy Dahl, who's an associate professor and extension specialist in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition. In the center you have Julie England, Family and Consumer Sciences Extension Agent in Lake County. And on the far right, myself, Wendy Lynch, the Family and Consumer Sciences Extension Agent in Putnam County. And I'll be the moderator for today's session. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you see this um, in session controls. If you're only seeing the small little strip where you see the little arrow, the microphone, and the list of names, the materials, etc., have disappeared, click on that orange arrow and it'll expand it. Also, if you look down for the mute button, it's always a good practice to mute yourself, even though I know our host is muting um, most of the participants. Then if you look down, to materials. There should be a little um, expand or collapse. There's four handouts. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and download each of those. One of those is a copy of today's slides. And then down a little further is the chat box. So we hope that you participate, um, ask questions. If you feel more comfortable um, asking it directly to um, our organizer or myself or Dr. Dahl, you can go to the drop down menu and find one of us on that list and send a private message if you prefer to do it that way. Um, and I think that's it on this. All right, so at the end of today's webinar, you will receive a link for a short evaluation and we hope that you will fill that out because it is a big, um, it helps us out a lot for future webinars and how to improve them. And without further ado, today's webinar, Health Benefits of the Mediterranean Diet. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so I guess I actually have the, the really lucky role today because I'm going to be talking specifically about the health benefits. And then Julie's going to take over and help you make some decisions and give you some ideas of how you can actually incorporate the Mediterranean diet. But what I thought we would do is we'd start with a case study. So our case study today is DJ. She's a 50-year-old female in good health, and so if you want to change DJ's age, feel free to. She could be 30, she could be 40, she could be 60, because the, the evidence that I'm going to present in terms of the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet uh, clearly shows that it's actually never too late, never too late to actually start adopting some of these changes for the health benefits. So DJ has been turning as she's turning 50, she's thinking about her health and wellness. We tend to, we always tend to think about our health and wellness when we hit those those critical um, decades. She is wondering if any um, changes she can make to her diet that would be worthwhile, that would really make a difference in her health and wellness as she ages. And so she's hoping, of course, to stay healthy for you know at least a, a 20 years, maybe 30 years. And her biggest fear is dementia. So what what sort of advice should we give DJ in terms of her health? So there's all sorts of information out there, um, lots of different competing things in terms of what we could do to improve our health. I mean, there's some people that decide to become vegetarian for those health benefits. Um, there's the push for organic foods. Um, definitely, we hear about in terms of all the, you know, the, the uh, negative health effects of some of the processed foods that we consume. But we have to remember that um, processing could be as simple as grinding 
or perhaps canning, those types of processes. And some of those foods, of course, are, still have health benefits. So we perhaps don't want to totally um, dismiss processed foods. Um, should we snack? Should we not snack? Should we choose functional foods that have perhaps you know added fiber or probiotics? You name it. There's so many things out there, and there's a lot of research out there to support some of these. Things. And, and another thing you hear in terms of whether or not you should have a multivitamin mineral supplement, whether you should supplement specifically. And these have been strong trends in terms of looking at, you know, some panacea that's going to really help our, our, our health and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I would challenge you today that perhaps, perhaps you don't need to choose any of the above. And perhaps the strongest evidence for health benefits now call a dietary pattern approach or a diet pattern approach. So looking at the big picture versus focusing on individual things like organic versus non-organic. So who should DJ believe? Okay, in terms of, of who should, should she she believe expert opinions in terms of what sort of choices to make. So we can think about the Dr. Oz's of the world and individuals like that. Um, should she listen to health professionals? Should she listen to the dietary advice of her physician? Um, should she be searching on the internet, which we all tend to do, um, search for the answers to our, our health problems and that type of thing on the internet? Should we, she ask a neighbor? Should she read a book? And I would think, you know, the answer to any of these, there's not really a yes or no answer to any of these because um, some of the experts out there, some of the things they say are accurate, some are inaccurate. Health professionals, the same thing. Some of the things that the physician may say in terms of nutrition are accurate and perhaps some are out of date because they have a lot to keep up on. The internet also, depending on the information and the source of information, it could be right on or it could be, of course, totally bogus. And your neighbor, it all depends on who your neighbor is, and even more so in terms of where your neighbor is getting their evidence. And books also. Books can, can have good information, not so good information, but what influences or what should influence us the most is what is the evidence in terms of, oops, what is the evidence in terms of, of really where do we have research that provides us the evidence of true health benefits. Okay, and so what I'm going to present to you this morning is the evidence at this top of this pyramid. We often uh, see information, you know, in the headlines of the newspapers and things like that, that um, you know a certain spice or a certain vitamin or um, certain foods going to have a tremendous health benefit. But then, if you read farther down in the article, it might have been an animal experiment. Well, we should never make a decision on human health based on animal research. Animal research, test tube research, that's important in terms of finding out how things work and testing things. But we should always make our decisions based on the highest level of evidence is right up here at the top of the curve. Um, things like, for instance, a case report, that would be like if it works for your neighbor, it should work for you. But I would challenge you and say it needs to work for a lot more people before you make that decision because you don't know why it's perhaps worked for your neighbor but it might work it might work for you but it might not okay so what I'm going to present to you are is evidence first from cohort studies which are large large studies that follow healthy people at least at the beginning of the study often the people are healthy they follow thousands of people into the future um, ask them about their diet intake and through the years and then find out what diseases they develop and, and which ones don't develop disease. So I'm going to talk to you about that. That's the type of study used for prevention. Okay. So the decisions that we make if we want to prevent, for instance, breast cancer or heart disease, we rely on those types of studies. If we want to treat a disease, we rely on the, on the research that comes from what we call randomized control double-blind studies. Those are experimental studies where they test a nutrient or a dietary plan to see if it works. Okay, so next slide please. 
So we're, now let's start talking about the Mediterranean diet. And as I already mentioned, I have really a lot of good news to say in terms of the evidence that's out there on the health benefits of the Mediterranean dietary pa diet pattern. Uh, it really all goes back to the 1970s. There was research collected, it's called the Seven Countries Studied in the 1970s, published in 1980, and they noted that these farmers in Crete, uh, so that's in the middle of the Mediterranean, consumed a diet that was very high in fat, but these farmers had very low cardiovascular disease, so low risk of stroke, heart attack, um, is just quite amazing actually. And so here we are decades later, and um, now we're just really trying to move into eating in a dietary pattern similar to what these farmers ate in the 1970s. One of, uh, um, really the, one of the pivotal studies was the Lion Heart Study where they put individuals, people had, that have already had a heart attack, they actually put them on the Mediterranean diet and they started to follow them to see if, if they had another heart attack or if they survived, that type of thing. That was an interesting study because within four years, less than four years really, there was such a big difference between the individuals following the Mediterranean diet and not following that diet in terms of future heart attacks and death rates that they actually had to stop the study. And that also happened in terms of this PERIMED study. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. They compared people following the Mediterranean diet with added olive oil or added nuts to a low-fat diet. And we've, over the years, the recent years, we've heard so much about health benefits of, of a low-fat diet, but this study really challenged the health, some of the health benefits of the low-fat diet because this study, again, had to stop the initial study early because there were such strong benefits for the Mediterranean diet compared to a low-fat diet. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at the Mediterranean here. So here's Crete. That was that's the, the seven country study included Crete. We hear about the Mediterranean diet in terms of, of like Italy, people in Spain consume it, and the islands here. But let's not forget too that actually northern Africa and the Middle East also traditionally consumes a Mediterranean diet. Not exactly the same as what an Italian or a Spanish diet would be like, but definitely in Libya and Syria and um, northern Egypt, those areas also could traditionally consume a, a Mediterranean diet. So next slide, please. Okay, so Julie's going to talk much more about about the Mediterranean diet, but I'm just going to take a quick look here, just show you a quick look in terms of what they actually measure for the studies that I'm going to talk about and the health benefits I'm going to talk about. And so they use different kind of scoring systems in terms of whether or not people are following what we call a Mediterranean diet. And so this example here, it's a, it's the diet, Mediterranean diet adherence scale, and you can has a number of questions and you get a point for each question. So if you use olive oil as your main culinary fats, so in terms of you know the preparation of meals, if you say yes, you get a point. And number two usually shocks everybody. How much olive oil do you consume in a given day? So you get a point if you consume more than four tablespoons of olive oil. So this is you know really the, the top of the Mediterranean diet in terms of you know as close to how they would have consumed it traditionally in the Mediterranean. So a lot of olive oil consumption, but as you'll see when I talk about the health benefits, uh, the closer you get to a higher, or the higher the score you get, the more health benefits you get. So you don't necessarily have to have a 100% score here. So how many vegetable servings do you consume in a day? So we want, they're encouraging at least two servings of vegetables, greater than three servings of fruit, uh, they ask about meat in terms of red meat, hamburger, sausage. Uh, they're recommending less than one a day. Uh, also with butter, less than one a day. Carbonated beverages, less than one a day. Wine, they're encouraging up to seven glasses plus a week. And legumes, so beans, peas, and lentils, greater than three servings a week. And fish. So, in, so really what they're asking is less red meat, more fish consumption, so greater than or equal to three servings a week, and also to really um, limit any kind of commercial sweets. So those are the donuts, the cakes, the cookies, biscuits, 
and to incorporate nuts. So more than three servings of nuts a day and uh, some lean meat, like for instance, chicken and turkey. And I don't know if too many people eat rabbit these days, so it's on their list. And and really, the, what, the last point there is whether or not in whether or not you consume these kind of pasta dishes, pasta dishes with vegetables prepared with tomato and onion and garlic and olive oil. So that in a nutshell, that is one of the many of the research studies use this scale to evaluate how close people are, are coming to the Mediterranean diet. Okay, next slide please. And there's also a bit more of a westernized version of this Mediterranean diet score where points are lost for eating sweet desserts and fried foods and fast foods and points are added for the consumption of olive oil, um, wine, ocean fish, etc. So there's quite a few variations, but for the most part they're on the same sort of theme. A diet high in olive oil, lots of fruits and vegetables, some whole grains, and wine if it, it fits into your usual intake. Next slide please. So Olive oil really is the basis to the Mediterranean diet, but it's not the only thing that has the health benefits, but definitely it's linked to some of the health benefits. And I just wanted to show you this slide in terms of looking at the different dietary fats, is that the, perhaps the unique thing about olive oil is this yellow bar here. So it's the oleic acid. Uh, so for the most part, about 75% of the fat in olive oil is this oleic acid um, so and with its health benefits a monounsaturated fatty acid and and some of the other fats on the list plant breeders are trying to up the amount of oleic like there is a high oleic canola oil there's now a high oleic palm oil the other oils the other manufacturers and, and farmers growers of oil are trying to up the oleic because that's thought to be an important part of the health benefit of olive oil. One of the other things that perhaps is is also helping with the health benefit is the blue bar. So the omega-6 fatty acids are really like really low compared to all of the others and, and that is also considered a health benefit because the omega-6 fatty acids can contribute to inflammation, um, suppressed immune system, that type of thing. So, and of course some saturated fat. We're not going to talk too much about saturated fat because there's a lot of controversy about that at this point in time. But olive oil seems to have the, the fat profile for optimal health. Next slide. Okay, so Julie's going to talk lots more in terms of the um, healthy Mediterranean um, diet in terms of food choices and that sort of thing, but I just wanted to mention, if you remember with the Mediterranean uh, diet score and the Mediterranean, uh, in terms of adding up your points, they were encouraging upwards to four tablespoons of oil a day. And so um, we that is a diet very, very different than what we've typically been consuming in the U.S. and that's actually been recommended here in the U.S. And so our most recent dietary guidelines, if you look at like say 2,000 calories, that's about how much I would eat in a day, um, it's, it's recommending about 27 grams of fat, so that's about two tablespoons. And so our, our recommendations nationally even though Mediterranean diet now is being recommended for its health benefits, it's still it's still kind of a westernized uh, approach to the Mediterranean diet that we haven't quite, you know, got onto at least got our heads around that perhaps we need to move away from the low-fat diet. Perhaps we need to move to a higher fat diet, but of course keep calories in control. And so that's you know that's a bit of a challenge. So next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to handle some of the diseases, and I'm just going to briefly mention um, some of the some of these studies. And what you'll notice is that everything I'm presenting is either 2015 or 2016 um, data. There is an, an enormous amount of of research so, to support the health benefits now of the Mediterranean diet, and so I've picked some of the the really the top level of evidence, the large studies um, uh, that that deal with the different diseases. So we'll start with cardiovascular disease because that's really what where the Mediterranean diet started in terms of looking at those reduced risk of, 
of heart attack and stroke. So this study, and, and you can see it's called the HAPPY study at the bottom there, and you can see these people look pretty happy drinking their wine. Yeah, they're probably sitting on the Mediterranean right now. Um, but, and actually this study was done in Eastern Europe. So uh, it was a study, 19,000 men and women, so a very, very large study. And they looked at how well people adhered to the Mediterranean diet, so whether they were making all of those choices that are recommended or some of them, and then they looked at whether or not um, they developed cardiovascular disease, and, and specifically death. So heart attack and stroke causing death. And, um, and they found definitely the higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet reduce the risk of death. Next slide, please. Um, more, a little bit more with cardiovascular disease. Uh, people with the highest adherence to the Mediterranean diet definitely lower, lower death, but reduced risk of coronary heart disease, heart attack, stroke. And what they looked at more specifically in this study is that it seems like those benefits link most to the olive oil, to the fruits, the vegetables, and the legumes. So that's the beans, peas, and lentils. So the average reduced risk was like 40%, which is phenomenal in terms of reducing risk. Next slide. So the one other thing that I want to mention with cardiovascular disease is we know that obesity has a tremendous effect on increasing one's risk for cardiovascular disease for heart and stroke. And so this is kind of good news because we do have a population that has a high percentage of us are obese and overweight. And so this study looked, again, very large study again, looking at men and women, average age of about 38 years, and they followed them for about 11 years to see what they developed. And so there were the, again, the better adherence to the Mediterranean diet was re, was associated, was linked to these reduced risks of heart attack and stroke. But what they concluded was that it seemed to lessen the harmful effects of overweight and obesity, which is which is fabulous news because that even with existing o overweight and obesity, following the Mediterranean diet is going to help reduce heart attack stroke risk. And that's great news. And there's also evidence that it, it's never too late, that that heart and stroke risk can drop even if you start consuming the Mediterranean diet at 60 or older. Next slide, please. And so with blood pressure, uh, this, this um, research looks at about seven or six studies, more than 7,000 people that followed the Mediterranean diet, and, and definitely it has a beneficial effect on both the systolic, the high, the high number, and, the, and in individuals with normal, so even people with normal blood pressure, it'll bring it down, but mild hypertension definitely also brings it down. Next slide. The one thing about the blood pressure, though, is that it seems to be clear that it's not just the Mediterranean diet that works for blood pressure. Also, the DASH diet, if you, that's, a, that's a low fat and high fruit and vegetable diet. Um, also, the Nordic diet, that's kind of up and coming. But these dietary patterns share a lot of things. They share the high consumption of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, seeds, nuts, fish, dairy, dairy and lower consumption of meat and sweets and alcohol. And so, um, at least in limited amounts of alcohol in the Mediterranean diet, and all of those result in significant reductions of blood pressure. But if blood pressure is not the only thing you're after, then the Mediterranean diet may be more beneficial in terms of looking at overall cardiovascular risk, et cetera. So, okay. so heart failure, even something like heart failure, big study of men, Again, high adherence to Mediterranean diet associated with a lower risk of heart failure and death from heart failure. So one of the limitations of this study is that it's, they didn't look at women. So, so that's still to be investigated, but good news for heart failure. Metabolic syndrome, and not sure if you're familiar with this, but right now on the planet and, you know, in your neighborhood everywhere, we, 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 we have rates of metabolic syndrome at about 25%. So if you look globally, 25% of people on this planet have metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome, there's different ways to define it, but in general, it's increased body weight, um, elevated blood pressure, um, problems with lipids like so elevated cholesterol, and high fasting glucose. And often, 
also with the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, they have a waist circumference. And the numbers that they often use is 40 inch waist for a, a man and a 35 inch waist for a woman. But what's what's notable with the waist circumference is that at least here in the, in the United States, that measurement of, of 35 and 40 is definitely not the natural waist. It's, it's a measurement below the natural waist, so, so it actually is a fairly tight guideline of, of what the waist circumference is. So the problem, the, the issue with metabolic syndrome is that people who have the metabolic syndrome, many of them are going to develop type 2 diabetes and also have problems with cardiovascular disease, heart and stroke. And so that's why we're so concerned in terms of the numbers of people with metabolic syndrome. So there's been four very large, large studies, prospective studies looking into the future, following people, um, and, and that has decreased risk. And also, um, on this next slide, um, metabolic syndrome, for each, it, it gives you some um, data here, for each 10% increase in your Mediterranean diet score, so that's one to two points in the score we looked at, was associated with 15% lower risk of cardiovascular incidence, so actually being diagnosed with cardiovascular disease, which is great news because if you can if you can get you know three four points more in the Mediterranean diet score, you perhaps can reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease by 30%. Okay, next slide. So also with type 2 diabetes, the Mediterranean diet is, so people with existing diabetes, uh, if they follow the Mediterranean diet, it's associated with better blood sugar control and cardiovascular risk factors like cholesterol and blood pressure also, then compared to um, a diet lower in fat. And Right now, that's been, you know, really that's been the norm in terms of recommending, you know, for um, diabetes prevention and diabetes management is a lower fat diet. But the evidence suggests that the Mediterranean diet may be better. Okay? So definitely suitable for management. Weight loss. Weight loss, I mean, weight loss is difficult and it's hard to get success. But it looks to be that following a Mediterranean diet gives about the same amount of benefits as following a low-carb diet. And if you look at all the diets, whether it be you know, all the evidence of testing all the different diets out there, um, a low-carbohydrate diet seems to be the most effective, but it, but it doesn't have the other health benefits of the Mediterranean diet. So, like for instance, you know, following a, a high-protein diet has some negative um, metabolic effects in terms of cholesterol and blood pressure, those types of things even with weight loss. So the Mediterranean diet is beneficial in terms of weight loss but also has all those other benefits in terms of reducing blood pressure and, and blood glucose, etc. Muscle mass, so this is, and I was actually surprised at some of these because I searched and searched to see, you know, how many diseases have they actually even looked at? And I was surprised to see that they've even studied the effects of the Mediterranean diet on muscle mass. And this is something really up and coming. We, we now know that there's a significant amount of evidence that by the time we get to be 50 years old, we, we really start to lose muscle mass quite quickly, especially women because they have less to lose. So it's a big issue. And so there's evidence that um, following the Mediterranean diet, you're gonna, you have an increased muscle mass. So, so fabulous news. So less risk of becoming frail and weak um, in your later years. Arthritis, well, and I kind of um, looking at arthritis and autoimmune disease and those in, in general, there's where there's not um, much evidence yet. In, in general, all that they found for at least people that have arthritis is that it helps with their risk of, again, cardiovascular disease because people with arthritis have an increased risk there. So there's not really much evidence in, in terms of uh, looking at you know, the inflammation of, of diseases like arthritis, but I guess we'll see. Maybe more studies will be done. Okay. More good news, if we look at adherence to the Mediterranean diet and risk of cancer, it can't get any stronger than this. The Mediterranean diet is associated with lower risk of overall cancer mortality, so death from cancer, as well as the incidence, so actual diagnosis, of colorectal cancer, breast cancer, gastric 
cancer, which is stomach cancer, prostate cancer, liver, head and, and even head and neck cancer. You know, and, and of course, people with the highest risk of head and neck cancer are, for instance, smokers, etc. So fabulous news in terms of prevention, but there's also good news in terms of treatments. And or next slide, please. Okay, and so one of the other studies that I just wanted to mention is that is again this PeriMed study. It was uh, it was an experimental study, so they actually put people on the Mediterranean diet and put them on a low fat diet to to compare. And so there was two two of the different types of Mediterranean diet: one with lots of nuts, one with lots of olive oil, and then they did the low fat diet. And you can see in the in the conclusions here. They say that that the Mediterranean diet, particularly supplemented with the olive oil, is is effective in in preventing breast cancer. So that's that's fabulous news. And the and the last thing I'm going to mention is about dementia. If you remember, that was DJ or case study's worst fear in terms of developing dementia. The good news is that. There is evidence that dementia is decreasing. We thought, at least researchers thought, and, and we thought that dementia with all the baby boomers coming, that dementia rates would increase. And in fact, they're actually decreasing. But next slide, please. The Mediterranean diet is helpful in the prevention of dementia. So adherence to the Mediterranean diet is, is linked with less cognitive decline, less dementia, and even less Alzheimer's disease. So they've looked at different types of studies, longer studies, trial, experimental studies, and there's mounting evidence in the prevention of dementia. And so diet and dementia really is linked to that whole dietary pattern approach versus individual nutrients and supplements and things like that. It's all about getting that dietary approach. So I'm going to end on some unanswered questions uh, about the Mediterranean diet, and, and this is really you know, my, really due to my selfish interest because I really wonder where cheese fits in. Because much of the research when they've done with the Mediterranean diet, they've encouraged low-fat dairy products. And, um, but in the Mediterranean, they actually consume a, a fair bit of higher dairy products in the form of cheese, which also has sodium added to it in, in some cases. And so that this is being questioned at this point in time of whether or not um, there's any disadvantage, including at least some higher fat dairy products versus versus just the the low fat. So that that we'll we'll have to follow up on that in the in the future. Okay. So it's all yours, Julie. Cheese is one of my big things too. So glad you're checking into that. So now that Wendy's talked about some of the benefits, and obviously there are a lot of benefits, and and I do want to reiterate the fact that you don't have to go, that just making small changes can have a big effect. And there's really good research that talks about that. And so when we think about going from what Wendy was talking about to how you're going to do it in your family, in your life. And so remember, it's not the Mediterranean diet. It really is a Mediterranean lifestyle. And there's no one perfect option even in the Mediterranean, there's no one Mediterranean lifestyle. So, but it is plant-based and it's not vegetarian. What plant-based is, is incorporating more plants in your diet as opposed to being meat-based. So yes, you still get to eat meat, seafood, eggs, whatever. It's not a vegetarian diet, but it's more place based on plants. But like any other food system that you're going to follow, it has to be food that you enjoy. Because if you don't like it, you're not going to eat it. So there really are a lot of different options. And it's kind of interesting what Wendy was talking about, talking about the dietary guidelines and what the traditional Mediterranean diet is. There's no one perfect eating plan. And the dietary guidelines, which we're going to be talking about on April 20th, even they can't agree. So, the, But the guidelines include the basic, um, the U.S. style of healthy eating pattern, the healthy Mediterranean style, and then a vegetarian style. But when we look, and, and they're based on, say, cultural as well as personal preferences. And when we look at the dietary guidelines, this is the one, and I, I put a link at the bottom of this slide so you can look at this or save it. But we look at it, 
And one of the questions that often comes up, because one of the pyramids talks about servings, the dietary guidelines talks about things in cups and ounces. So for example, what we might consider a serving of meat is probably about three ounces or three equivalents. But this is really a nice chart because it talks about incorporating different colors of vegetables. It talks about the grains, whole grains, and you can go to the um, website and it, you could get kind of an estimate about what your calories should be. But this is really a nice chart, but it does talk about like Wendy talked about down at the bottom with oils, that their recommendation for oils are different than the recommendation for in some of the other versions of the pyramid that we're going to look at next. But just remember, a tablespoon of oil is about 13 and a half grams, and it's about 120 calories. So yes, we want to encourage you to eat more oil, uh, you know, extra virgin olive oil. However, if you were to get the four tablespoons, that is the recommendation, that's 500 calories approximately in a day. And is that something you want to eat? And how would you incorporate it? But also going back to more the plant-based idea, if you're eating more plants, um, fruits and vegetables, you're getting more nutrition, but also they're generally um, less caloric. And so in your handouts, you've got two different versions of the Mediterranean diet pyramid. And this one's from your, um, there's a handout that says it's called Old Ways. And so it's in there. And this one, it's nice and pretty. And it talks about, you know, gives you the pyramid and things like that. But I really prefer the next one, which is in your handout from, if I get my slide to change, there's a link to this version of it down below on the slide. And you'll get the slide set so you can get the links. But in the handout that's from um, University of Arizona, it's also in there as well. And I like this one because it tells me more. So I know when I look at this pyramid, what the recommendations are. And one of the things kind of towards in the bottom and kind of the teal colored slide, it talks about water and herbal infusions. We really haven't talked about sweetened beverages today, but we want to emphasize the importance of having less added sugars, you know, not drinking sodas, things like that. So think about that. But And we're going to go through this all together, so I'm going to skip through it. And down at the bottom of this pyramid, it talks about the non-diet recommendations, which include regular physical activity. So very important for, you know, in some ways, it's the magic bullet for good health. Regular physical activity is great, is really, really important, but also getting adequate, adequate rest. But other parts of the pyramid also, especially this version, talks about social and cultural values of meals. You know, getting together to, to talk, um, the biodiversity, seasonality. This version even goes into eco-friendly products and culinary activities like cooking as a family, things like that. So it's not all about diet and what you eat. It's a lifestyle involved as well. But the dietary dairy part focuses on fresh, real food, seasonal food. And no processed foods aren't evil, but we should be eating less of them, but also to look at the difference between minimally processed versus, you know, highly processed foods. The more processed a food gets, the more likely you are to have more additives that you don't want. Trans fats, sugars, you know, saturated fat, fats, things like that. But to focus on real food, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, fish, and seafood, lean meat, and healthy fats. And in Florida, I know not everybody on the webinar is from Florida, but the Florida Department of Agriculture has, uh, over on the left side of your slide, every month you can go to the link below and it'll tell you what's in season in Florida. And also, University of Florida has a nice little wheel that all shows, shows you some of the seasonality of Florida. And so think about eating what's in season. What you're doing is you want to focus on the flavor because our goal isn't deniable food, is to deny yourself something, but you want to improve your eating plan. Going back to what Wendy was talking about, which was 
making small changes towards the Mediterranean diet, even if you make a few of them, it can have positive good effects on your health. So making more of them, certainly a bigger change. And to go for quality ingredients. When I think of quality ingredients, chocolate comes to mind, which is one of our <clears throat> sometimes foods. But if you're having food that has more flavor, you can eat a smaller amount of it and it satisfies you. So think about that fresh flavor, you know, using herbs that gives your food flavors that pop. And for example, in our picture in the bottom of the slide, we have a sandwich that we've added, you know, radishes and it's either cucumber or zucchini, I can't really tell, and fresh lettuce. So you're adding fresh things, you're adding fresher flavors. And so you're probably going to be more likely to be satisfied with it. And of course, choosing a whole a bread that's got more whole grain in it as well. So thinking about that less may equal more. So simplifying your food pre preparation and thinking about even if all you do is if you're preparing a food, if you're just adding more vegetables into it, you, know, you don't have to completely change the way that you're doing everything. To, um, you just need to make some changes to modify what you're doing and how you're doing it so that it fits into your lifestyle. Because if it's not going to fit, you're not going to follow it. And so here are some of the recommendations that are some of them are slightly different than the dietary guidelines. These are based on the pyramid from this slide. But, but to think about every meal, one to two servings of fruit, vegetables, two or more servings of vegetables. You know, and preferably fresh, but certainly frozen um, or minimally processed, canned if you have to. Olive oil. And when we're talking about olive oil, we're talking about extra virgin olive oil. We'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end. But olive oil. And then, of course, what kind of grains are you having? Bread, pasta, rice. You know, preferably, according to this one, you know, two servings per meal. But every day importance of getting dairy, preferably low fat, especially for at all age, everybody needs to have um, dairy products, making sure that they're getting their calcium. And then the new emphasis more so on, on adding nuts and seeds um, as a good source of protein and also healthy fats. And then seasoning your food with herbs, spices, garlics, and onions, which equals less added salt, which can potentially help with blood pressure, but they also add flavors and making sure that you have a variety of flavors as well. And then when we think, and I, and I hope some of you, and we've talked about this previously, I hope you do plan your meals weekly or at least for several days in advance because it really will help you eat healthier. And so one of the things to think about is less potatoes. Um, no, potatoes aren't evil, but, you know, aim for, you know, French fries, most, Definitely not one of your healthier options, but potential eating less potatoes, um, white meat having two servings a week, um, fish and seafood, two or more, eggs, um, two to four, legumes. How many times do you eat legumes in the week? That might be something to think about when you're making some diet dietary changes. Red meat, less than two servings a week. And I think a lot of Americans have a problem with eating too much red meat. And then processed meats, things like bacon, um, salami, luncheon meats, um, certainly um, one or less servings of them a week. And I just need to double check to see if we had any questions in the box as we were going on. I did have a question. Uh, that, let's see. Directing towards Wendy, I'm allergic to seafood and don't like the taste of fish. What omegas do I need to look for in a supplement? Secondly, how do I know how many I need daily? Do you want to answer that real quick, Dr. Dahl? Either she's muted or we'll go back to her. All Sorry, right. Sorry, I was muted, but I'll, 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 I'll send a, I'll, I'll, can we send a, answer that um, later? Because sure. that's a pretty specific question. Okay, thanks. All right. Okay, occasionally. Sweets and having sweets, um, two servings or less, and small amounts, and aiming for no trans fats. You know, when you're buying processed foods, trans fats can be a problem. So, especially if you like sweets, 
think about, you know, certainly reading the label, but also if you make your own, if you love cookies, making your own oatmeal cookies and freezing them, things like that. So that, yes, you can have your sweets and aim for two or less and have fruit for have fruit um, for dessert. Maybe drizzle it with a little bit of, I don't know, something flavored. Even it could be a little bit of a liqueur or something. But to think a little think a little bit differently about what you're having for dessert. And wine, actually, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes you see that it says red wine for the Mediterranean diet. Others say it doesn't matter. Certainly, if you don't drink wine, don't start. And certainly in moderation. And one per day for women max and two per day for men. And a serving of wine is about five ounces. So, but it is whatever is appropriate for you. And the diet, as we've said before, it focuses on fresh, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, increasing your fruits and vegetables. And having a variety of different colors gives you a variety of different nutrients. So, but also they provide fiber and they're just really, really important to increase them in your diet. And aim for fresh most often, frozen and canned or even dried. Think about mixing, having dried fruit for a snack. You actually even can get some dried vegetables occasionally. But think about ways that you can add, add more fruits and vegetables. Also, another emphasis is on grains. One of the pictures on here is um, forbidden rice, black rice. Has anybody on here ever tried black rice? It's, it's, you know, it's one of those things you can find it more and more in your grocery stores, but it has a lot nuttier flavor. It's kind of interesting. And it's something, so there's lots of different rices you can try. Um, a tortilla, corn certainly would be healthier than a flour tortilla. Switching your, pro, your pasta to whole grain pasta. Or also, one thing with pasta, people tend to have too big a servings of it. They have the big plate full of it and not enough of it. So consider how you're, what kind of grains you are and do aim for whole grains and look for new ones. You know, we have ancient grains, lots of quinoa, although technically a seed, it's in the grain group. Lots of different ones to try. Um, fish and lean meats, you know, canned, you know, canned salmon and things like that might not be the first choice, but certainly a good way to add it. Nice to have in your pantry so that you can and you don't have something to eat, you can whip out that can of salmon or tuna and have it. But it's also how you prepare them. You know, certainly not fried chicken very often. That would be one of those sometimes foods. But grilled, baked, um, the shrimp down at the bottom in the picture with the fresh herbs that are, looks like they're broiled, looks delicious. So legumes, and actually there's a really nice link on the bottom of this page to some recipes from North, North Dakota State University. But legumes are great for snacks. You can make hummus and take fresh food to dip them in. Um, you can buy dried beans that you can, there's some like dried garbanzos that you can snack on, but they provide fiber, protein. They're inexpensive, generally speaking. They're very heart healthy. Lots of different terry, different dietary patterns um, recommend increasing your legumes. They are a nutritional powerhouse. So look for ways to include more legumes in your diet, as well as nuts and seeds, healthy snack, healthy fats, protein, and fiber. Dairy. Certainly, when we talk about bones, um, uh, we think of milk and milk products, dairy products. So they're an important source, not just of calcium, but other nutrients. So think about ways, you know, certainly yogurt and Greek yogurt provides um, more protein than regular yogurt. Look for, uh, if you're going to have yogurt, search for the ones that have probiotics so that you can have a healthy gut. So do make sure that you're including dairy products, but do aim for low-fat dairy products most often. So let's think about olives. Okay, so Wendy was talking about olive oil and how it's such a focus on the Mediterranean diet. So olives are really kind of interesting because the color of olives, and there are a, lot, there are a number of different varieties, but generally speaking, the color of the olives, it's when they were harvested. So, 
And in the Mediterranean, they're usually harvest in October through January, but the greenest olives, our green olives are harvested earlier in the season and red and pink, kind of the mid season and black in the later season. And so they can't be eaten raw. They're either um, soaked in a lye solution to remove bitter compounds or they, and or fermented with brine um, for several months prior to packaging. And so one thing to think about with olives, so yes, they do have healthy oils, but whole olives also, since they're cured, are generally going to be reasonably high in salt. So lots of different ways to get olives, you know, black, green, personal preference. Um, many people like both. But basically, a serving size, about five medium olives, has about two grams of healthy fat. But they do have, like canned ones, have probably around 100 milligrams of sodium. So, oops, going the wrong way. So think about ways to have olives and enjoy them in your food, but do watch for this, um, the salt content. And so when we look at and another question we have is, Olive oils. What kind of olive oil should I buy? It's kind of interesting. The third one down on our chart, light olive oil, people say, oh, it's light. It must be healthier. It must be low calorie. Well, actually, light olive oil is a refined oil. It's been refined to be light in flavor. So we want to encourage people to be eating extra virgin olive oil because it's the most flavorful and healthiest. It's And it's naturally produced without heat and chemicals. And it's got it retains its healthy antioxidants from the olives. And so you make it by either crushing the olives without adding any heat. You'll see sometimes it'll say cold pressed on it. But but the other ones are refined. And it, like anything else, when you're processing something, you're, lose, you're losing something. So with the refining of the olive oil, you're losing some of the antioxidants, some if not all of the antioxidants and some of its healthy, healthy um, healthy benefits. So basically, extra virgin olive oil, it's crushed. Sometimes they'll say the first crushed. Pure olive oil is refined, and they add back in some of the extra virgin olive oil to give it some flavor. Say light olive oil is also refined. They've just refined it a little bit differently to keep it light flavor. And then sometimes you'll see pomace oil at your grocery store. And it's actually been further refined and it's um from the pulp so they extract some of the oil so you're definitely losing some of the health benefits or if not all of them and to be labeled as extra virgin this is kind of a long slide so i'm just going to kind of skip over it but there are certain standards related to what's classified as extra virgin olive oil so do look for it and some things to think about when you're shopping for olive oil is well, it it doesn't get better with age. So, you know, keeping it doesn't matter. You want to maybe, if you don't use a lot of it, to maybe buy smaller quantities of it and get fresh more often. Uh, one of the things that sometimes you hear about is keeping in a dark bottle can help stop it from degrading very pro possibly. And also, but do store it in a cool, dark place. And... Take care of it, but do rotate it. There's lots of different olive oils out there. There's infused olive oils, which are kind of interesting. I've used some of those, and they're quite tasty. But just do make sure that you're going for the extra virgin olive oil. And a great way to add olives, to add olive oil into your life is to use it for a lot of different seasonings. You could drizzle it over vegetables, making your own salad dressings. Salad dressings tend to have a lot of salt and other things in it. So the link at the bottom of the slide is from University of Nebraska Extension, and it's got some really it's got some recipes for doing fresh oils, um, fresh salad dressings. So the classic French vinaigrette is three three to four parts oil and one part of acid, which could be vinegar, could be citrus juice. I actually prefer personally prefer more of a tang, so I usually do mine half and half, but it's fun to play with them and that you can whisk them together, add fresh oils, I mean fresh herbs, dried herbs, and then make them in small amounts, store them in a glass jar, and make them fresh every couple days. It'll perk up the flavor. You can say they're great on different things like um, 
vegetables, things like that. Which leads us to how do you season your food? One of the things that we're focusing on is adding um, fresh herbs. And also it mentions onions and garlic, all of my favorite things. But think about how you season your food when you're adding fresh herbs. You're also adding some nutrition. A lot of herbs have quite a lot of antioxidants in them. So buy fresh, start an herb garden, go to your local extension office or go on our website and find information on growing herbs in your area. Depends on what state you're in. In Florida, we have a whole lot of different seasons for growing herbs than you would say if you're in Wisconsin. So when we think about this whole big picture of the Mediterranean diet about how we're going to eat healthier, how are we going to incorporate these healthy ideas into our life? And it begins with, first of all, planning, thinking about what it is we want to accomplish, what we want to eat, making our, making our list, planning our meals, finding recipes, or just modifying things that we're already making and making changes of them to make them healthier. You don't have to change your whole life. You just want to tweak it a little bit, make it better, and make these changes one step at a time. It's going to make it easier. So do aim to choose fresh most often and try to eat seasonally. If you get a chance, go to the grocery, go to the farmer's market or even look at your grocery store and see what's from grown in Florida this time of year. So it's not getting shipped in from wherever. Try to eat stuff that's fresher. It's going to have more flavor. And making these changes and teaching your kids as you go along to involve the family to teach them healthy, um, healthy habits at an early life. And in your in your materials, there's this nice handout that has all your Mediterranean diet shopping list with some good ideas. So getting started, Wendy, Wendy Dahl loves this picture with the Mediterranean because it has Nutella on it, which um, I believe does have trans fats. But think about, remember, cutting the sweets, having them less often, you know, avoiding eating out, change how you snack, more fruits and nuts. Uh, think about count, instead of counting calories, count the number of fruits and vegetables you're having a day. If you do that, you're going to automatically reduce your calories and you're going to increase your nutrition and health by increasing your fruits and vegetables. That's pr probably on this list one of the biggest things that you can do to make a change is counting fruits and vegetables, not the calories. You know, up your intake of fish and seafood. Eat red meat less often. And alcohol in moderation if you choose. And say, I do add that extra vegetables. Uh, one last slide before we'll talk about the look at the questions. Finally, truly, making small changes in your diet can improve your overall health. And making these changes towards the Mediterranean lifestyle has been shown through research that it can be very helpful. You don't have to make them all at once. You don't have to make them all, but you can make them. So focus on fresh, flavorful foods. Focus on healthier oils in your diet and always include physical activity in your plan. So with that, let's go back and um, check the check the box. Let's see. And if when so there was one. Yes, there, there was one Wendy. question about um, there was one question about keeping salads fresh, whether or not to take them out of the plastic bag. Um, and I know Dr. Dahl mentioned um, she buys her vegetables much more often to keep, you know, obviously to keep them fresh. I know in my household, um, one bag doesn't last very long, so I portion them out. And actually, I kind of do what Becky suggested about meal planning and go ahead and put them in glass containers. That's what I use at my my home, and they tend to last um, longer than they have than they do actually go bad. Um, anybody else have suggestions? Feel free to type that in the chat box. One thing I do, I don't like to buy, and I realize there's convenience to buying bag lettuce and things like that, but I, I prefer to buy it and even just wash it myself and then for a couple of days put it in a plastic bag after I've spun it dry because that way I do think it, it does last longer. But there's certainly a convenience to buying um, the pre-made salads. And be, make sure they've got dates on them. Make sure that when you buy them, Maybe you're reaching to the back of this thing, making sure you're getting the one with the, you know, the most recent date. 
Okay, so many. And the oh. other question mm -hmm. that was asked from Becky, I've, I've got um, her contact information, so Dr. Dahl can answer that question. And portion control, I found that containers that I need to eat daily for food and break up my food items in the container per day. And that's really good, too, about certainly portioning them out. It's like, oh, well, I know I have this much to eat, uh, so I can spread it throughout the day. Because sometimes if you don't portion them, you don't eat enough of them. Or you eat, it depends on what it is. You may be eating too much or not enough. And let's see, any other questions? First of all, and we want to thank you all. I will be sending out the um, evaluation later in the day, as well as the link for the recording.